So I know, I know I said I was going to start the fun series now, but somebody asked a question in the comments and it had to do with analog electronics design and I was like, yay, because I've been doing so much digital stuff. And since the productivity gods hate me and want to distract me in every way possible, I got this package the other day and I'm resisting the urge to plug it into a printer. And I haven't done a Talk Nerdy To Me segment in a long time, so here we go. I figured this is something that I can bang out in a couple minutes because it, most of it's just off the top of my head here, other than having to go and, you know, show you little diagrams and things like that. So this individual was asking about the little RC filter network that I put on that you know, cheapy microphone just to do the, uh, the high shelf filter to take the peaks down a little bit. Oh, but consequently, if you don't want all this and you really just want the schematic, here it is. This is the microphone coil right here. Here's your plus output. Here's your minus output. Usually right here and right here is where you would connect the uh, wires that go to your XLR plug. This minus, it, that can just go right to the same thing just like it was, but we're also going to use that as a ground reference for a circuit. The plus is going to be interrupted. So usually this would go out like right like this to your jack. So we're going to have a resistor right here in the way. So connect one of that to the plus terminal. And then the other one's going to be connected to your XLR output. And also on the junction of that output, you're going to have this series connection of resistor and capacitor that's also going to be mounted to either the minus terminal or the uh, XLR output ground. So yeah, this circled in red is the uh, added circuit. And I said in that video that it was time for envelope math and literally that I just scribbled that out on my desktop because the practical equations are really simple. But I thought it would be easier if I uh, brought up a spice simulation program and drop the components in there and then show you the little graphs on, you know, a uh, logarithmic frequency chart to visually show you what all of the different components do rather than just like speaking equations at you. There will be some equations, but simple equations, because to walk you through the whole thing, unfortunately, doing it piecewise from the very beginning, it's a big integral, which means calculus, which is best left to computers. But thanks to, uh, well, you probably heard his name pronounced as Kirchhoff, but thanks to Kirchhoff in the melodious tones of the tongue of his fatherland, we don't have to do all of that. And all we're interested in is the minus 3 dB point, as in where the signal is down to half power, as in where capacitive reactance and resistance are equal. This is the equation that should be burned into your brain when you're talking about this stuff. Pretty simple approximation, and I'll give you your minus 3 dB point. However, this particular circuit is a shelf because we're limiting capacitive reactance at a particular place, so that just adds a couple other little variables to that equation. So let's go ahead and draw our schematic right here, very simple, and then I'll just label the components so we know what we're talking about. Now the basic form of the equation is the same, but it gets a lot more complicated just because of that additional resistor down there, R2. Now this has actually gotten to the point where envelope math might be a little meh I don't know about this unless you're gonna plug it into like Wolfram Alpha or something like that but there's difficult math and then there's tedious math this is not difficult it's just what I would say borders on tedious and funnily enough if you go back to the dark days of internet 1.0 you couldn't just look up this kind of math you had to dig it out of a textbook or figure it out yourself my very first personal web page was a site that just had equations for passive filters on it. But that was back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and Pentium 100s were still a viable CPU option. However, we have a lot of tools available to us now. And I'm not talking about just finding like a JavaScript RC filter calculator. I'm talking about spice simulation. Now, if you don't have a spice that you like, I recommend downloading LT Spice. It's free and it works on a ton of different platforms, but it's a little fiddly and ugly. So I'm going to be using Circuit Maker 2000, which I've been using since, well, 2000, when I got Circuit Maker to replace Electronic Workbench, if anybody remembers that. Are they still around? They might still be around, who knows. But I still have my original floppies if I ever need them. But before we get to simulation, slight tangent here to talk about loading effects. So if you already know this stuff, just skip ahead two minutes or so. This is analog electronics and this is part of a larger circuit. Well, I should say it has things that are plugging into it and things that are going out of it, things. In other words, it doesn't work in a vacuum. None of this stuff's unless you're working in a vacuum or if you put a buffer before and after so that you're isolating the circuit. We're not buffering anything and we don't have a transformer output on this microphone. 
So that brings us to another name, which is Thevenin. Thevenin, Thevenininainen, and his wonderful theorem. There's a problem that nerds have in that we read a lot of things and you don't hear a lot of stuff pronounced. It's much better now that we have Wikipedia, but back in the day, we used to run into all kinds of problems with words like Island, Hors Divorce, Viscount, Swave, and Epigony. That last one's a joke for the BTA fans out there. If you look this stuff for any length of time, you're going to come across the term Thevenin equivalent, or however the heck you pronounce his name. And that's just like taking all the stuff before something or after something, you know, just in a network of like resistance and impedances and those types of things, and lumping it all into like a, you know, a little black box that all you have to worry about is the impedance coming out of it, like what's reflected from that circuit into the circuit that you're dealing with. So we would have that before and after, but we don't have to really about worry about all that nonsense for our purposes, because our input impedance of the circuit after it is going to be at least 10 times higher than the output impedance of our circuit. So that shouldn't load it in any meaningful way unless you're using some like ancient mixer with like a 600 ohm input or some of them have very low like 2.5k inputs or something like that typically the stuff that we get the consumer level things that you would be plugging like an eight dollar microphone into are going to be like 10k 15k maybe like 20k or 50k even so effectively we can just ignore that that's one of my favorite terms effectively ignore because it means less math. But bear that in mind, because if you do plug this into a low impedance input, it is going to load your circuit and change our uh, minus three dB points slightly, as well as the overall gain of the circuit. Cool? All right. So feeding into our circuit, the only resistance that we have to worry about is, well, technically impedance. So we're just worried about what's coming out of the coil. So this is our lowly little circuit right here, and R1, R2, and C1, these are what we're gonna be varying here to see what the effect is. Now if we hit run on this simulation and put a test point right here at the junction of these two resistors, that's your output, you can see the curve. And right there is our minus, you know, three and a half decibel point all the way up here at like 20K. So we're never losing more than three and a half decibels. Now right here is the point that we're going to be testing relative to, that's at 20 Hertz. So we're going to find our minus 3 dB point as it's going to be right there as we go down here. So as you can go up, you see right here, it's like minus 1.7, minus 2.7. So minus 3 dB is going to be right around this area here, like 2.5K-ish kilohertz. So let's go ahead and duplicate that service, the service circuit. So as you can see right here, if I put a test probe on the output of each of these, they lay on top of each other and they're identical cool. The bottom one we're going to change a little bit. So let's swap this 0.27 microfarads resistor out for 0.33 and see how that behaves. Now, as you can see right here, let me put my little measurement tools up. Our minus 3 dB point, rather than being where it was, has moved down around like 2.1 kilohertz or so, because as you can see from the yellow line, we're getting our minus 3 dB roll off a lot sooner than we did, well, a lot is a relative term, sooner than we did before. And as you would expect, if we change this to 0.15, so a lower value of capacitor, our minus three dB cutoff point for the yellow line, which is our bottom one that we're changing, is going to be much higher than it was before. But what happens if we want uh, a little bit more than that or a little bit less than that for our shelf right up here where we're cutting off? Because everything above this, once that starts to flatten out, is going to be whatever the frequency it is. So let's change both of our uh, capacitors to 0.22 microfarads. That way they're both equal. And then we're gonna change this, our shunt resistor on the lower circuit to 330 instead of 470. And as we see right here, the yellow line, which is the one that we changed, we have a much greater dip. So that's why I mentioned earlier that you could put a potentiometer in there in a place of R2 and make this adjustable if you wanted, or you could tweak in the sound and then replace it with the resistor. Consequently, this simple type of tone circuit is what you would see in like uh, your guitar passive electronics or a lot of effects pedals or the presence control on guitar amplifiers and that sort of thing. And of course, if we change the value of that resistor upward, we're going to lessen the effect right here. So you can see with the yellow line that we've done when we change that to a 680 ohm resistor. And since our series resistor is the only thing we haven't messed with so far, let's go ahead and change that up to 330 from 220 and show what difference that makes, as you can see right here. You're essentially forming a more severe voltage divider and giving yourself more cut to work with, and consequently, any feeding resistance coming into our circuit is going to add to that series resistance, and this is the effect that it's gonna have. 
And just for a better visual comparison, let's go ahead and sweep some of these perimeters. So let's sweep the capacitor first, and we'll just sweep from 0.1 microfarads to 0.5 microfarads in one microfarad increments, and this is what it looks like. So that's going to show us each of those steps. And then we'll just do the same thing with R2, just to show you the difference there. And voila, pretty colors. Now, all right, for the sake of completeness, I'll do R1 too. Not R12, R1 as well, T-O, never mind. So yeah, that pretty much sums it up. There you go. I know that's more than you asked for, but I'm gonna give you your money's worth. You don't pay for these videos. But if you wanna pay for these videos, check out my subscription links in the uh, video description below. Techie nerdy mathy videos are actually pretty easy to make, so I don't mind doing this kind of stuff. But I know that that kind of stuff, if you throw it out too often, gets boring to people. So anyway, Thanks for indulging me in this. Hope you learned something. And until the next video comes out, get out there and make something awesome.